Good morning, folks. I want to thank you for, for coming out. My name is Dave Stokes. I work for Percona. And we're talking today on what life was like before open source. Uh, last year, I was at a conference similar to this, and someone asked me why I was so upset because a company was changing their license on their software. And that was kind of the genesis of this talk. Now, this is a review of some history, and history is always open to interpretation. One of the, by the way, this is Peter Farkas of FerretDB, who I'll be mentioning later. Uh, we look at history for different reason, reasons. Um, what were they doing several thousand years ago that might have been interesting? Um, what technical challenges were they looking at that we've kind of moved past? Uh, maybe there's someone who is influential that changed the course of history or an epic piece of time. And other times there's things that are pretty damn cool like the Bugatti up there. If they made Priuses and Teslas that look like that, we would have more of those on the road. Okay, open source, I feel, is under threat of extinction. Um, partially because of people not knowing the background, partially because of, of uh, causation from companies trying to make more money. Now, like I mentioned earlier, someone got real upset with, I uh, saw that I was upset when a company was changing their licenses. Uh, this is a list of some companies that have been changing some of their licenses for some of their products and uh, found this cartoon. And this is the view of a lot of folks. If you go around the show floor and say, uh, are all these big uh, vendors making money off the, the poor software vendors? Uh, yes and no. Could they do more? You'll see what my uh, answer is to that in a little bit later. So some people say, well, why are you giving this talk about open source being under threat? Doesn't everyone who has a piece of software have the ability to, uh, shouldn't they have the ability to take money off it? You know, you could be like a Jeff or a Mark, or even a Larry, you know, shouldn't everyone have their yacht? And uh, actually in here, I think everyone should have their own yacht. Uh, my family has a history tugboat, so I would love that. Um, and yeah, people do have a right to cash in. Uh, the only trouble right now is a lot of folks who have been around for less than 35 years on this earth don't really realize what they're missing, what life was like before open source. Um, I like to tell newbies that this is what we actually looked like in the 1980s. We were all ripped and walking around in bathing suits all the time. Uh, no, this was actually an advert. Uh, if you weren't around then, uh, you have no idea what the noise of the air handlers and the equipment, uh, the backup drive squeaking, and uh, just a mess. You probably couldn't spend time in a real computer room back then in a bathing suit for more than about three minutes before getting something frostbitten. And by the way, this is one computer. Uh, this is probably a more typical representation of what a computer room looked like. Once again, if you had a company that had a computer, it looked like this. Now, back before open source, computers were usually physically big. Your company might have had a computer. If you're a real Fortune 100 company, you might have had a handful of computers. And then many computers came along, and they were generally the size, like this Cromenko here of a uh, modern microwave, or maybe a little bit bigger uh, size of a refrigerator. And they generally had something called CPM or DOS. They were handy. Uh, they had their own functionality, but they were very expensive. Uh, like I said, your company had one computer. That's all they can afford. And then these little personal computers came out, Commodore PETs, TRS-80s, and eventually some of the Apple II line. And you can see business folks didn't take this particularly um, seriously because your backup was on a cassette tape. Uh, as you can see, this keyboard is not gonna be conductive to programming all day. They're kind of seen like a hobbyist toy type device. Um, if you were in a real serious environment and you had a disk drive, that's probably a five gig, gig disk <coughs> drive that the guy is pointing to there. Um, that was a real computer. And your big concerns if you're trying to share data with someone else is the format. Was it an ASCII or EPSIDIC? And which end of the byte did they start numbering from, the left or the right? And you really couldn't share a whole lot of data because things didn't really interoperate very well. And back then you had one choice. That was it, one choice. You bought everything from one vendor. Didn't matter who your vendor was. You bought hardware, software, training, support. 
you bought um, everything from them. There were limited third-party options for education, hardware support, software support. Uh, believe me, if you've plugged in a Fujitsu drive that you bought from Fujitsu into your IBM or your CDC or something like that, it could violate your support contract and suddenly you have no way of maintaining your machine. Uh, it was kind of a crazy time. Um, if you wanted source code, you're either told to take a hike or be, over, be able to fork over a lot of money. And your operating system did not include things that we take for granted today. If you wanted a compiler, Fortran, COBOL, RPG, Algol, ADA, whatever, that was an extra add-on that you had to pay for. Underline the pay in your mind because you paid a lot. And my COBOL program that I wrote on my machine would not run on Peter's machine because we had different vendors. And if someone else wanted to share code with you, nine times out of 100, you were gonna do a lot of rewriting if you was able to do it at all. And if your vendor decided that the old hardware line was not bringing in enough cash, they'd come out with a new hardware line. Um, the university I was working at um, <laughs> when I was getting my degree had a lot of invested in digital equipment corporation machines, and they got rid of the Earth's DC operating system and TOPS 1020 over something called VAX VMS, which was a very good operating system. But that meant that all the old hardware all the old software, all the training we had, all the investment we had was suddenly worth next to zero. Support costs for old hardware went way through the roof. And there were, once they uh, deprecated something, you really were stuck. So you could literally overnight have a very expensive computer. Once again, your school or university business, whatever, had a computer, maybe two computers. The value went to zero. And interoperability did not exist. Uh, something I wrote for a uh, TOPS 10 machine would not run on an IBM OS 360, uh, not a Singer, RCA Apollo, CDC Wang, or other computers. You made a choice, you were stuck with it. If you wanted to make another choice, you usually got rid of the old stuff, paid through the nose, and got another system. You literally had one choice to make, and from there on, you were committed. Uh, networking. Uh, networking really was kind of primitive in the late early 1980s. Uh, you had things like uh, Xerox's XNS, XNS that would talk to some devices. Uh, IBM had their own token ring. DEC had DECnet. Uh, TCP IP was just starting. And a lot of prominent vendors ignored it because who wants to talk to a machine not made by us? You know, that's kind of crazy. You want our stuff. And there were some capabilities to talk to something like IBM's SNA, which means you had a big investment in IBM plus whatever your new investment was that you wanted to talk to IBM. An old adage back then was nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. This, this poor man's laughing. Yeah, the the um, folks who say now that Oracle doesn't have customers, they have hostages, that's what IBM was. Um, and the crazy thing was it was the dominant player in the marketplace. And it was a great choice because they did a lot of great things just right. But if you weren't in their sphere of influence, you were out of luck. You were locked in. You made your one choice, that's it, you're stuck with it. And then there was what I like to call a disturbance in the force. Uh, AT&T Bell Labs, if there was more company that was more obnoxious to deal with at the time than IBM, it was American Telephone and Telegraph. They had a government regulated monopoly. One of their th things about running the phone system, in, especially in the US, was they needed to print something called a phone book. You didn't have one of these. If you wanted to look up somebody's number, you went to this book printed on thin paper and you looked up the name of the business and got their phone number. Now, as weird as that sounds, printing that phone book was a big business for AT&T. And they used an operating system called Multix which was very expensive, very proprietary, and even AT&T said, we spent enough money on Multics, you guys in the computer lab, do something else. So feeling emasculated, they decided to come up with their own operating system that they called Unix, which was a pun on um, being castrated. So they licensed Unix out to, by the way, if you've got a chance to talk to the old folks from AT&T Bell Labs, do. They are a wild bunch. Uh, they're all uh, very old these days, but they have great stories to tell. 
So at and has this, this operating system and it has some really neat stuff into it. And the universities start begging for it. So at and licenses it as a trade secret. By the way, if you license this software, and I did at the time, you had a multi-page legal contract that your lawyers would just look at and say, oh God, you are giving away the store to this. But you got a copy of it. And one of the folks they, they gave it to, or licensed it to, was University of California, Berkeley which became the Berkeley distribution of Unix. They also licensed it to other folks, and you really didn't get the source code, um, You, in most cases. And uh, it was modular designed, and it was one of the first operating systems, not the first operating system, written in C, not assembly language. Before then, everything you ran into was written in assembly language, which means your operating system was not portable. And that was a, a major godsend. It was so revolutionary that some guy wrote a commentary on the source code on version 6 Unix, which had one go to in it. It was considered the epitome, the epitome of programming at the time. It was the bee's knees. It showed you how to write a device driver, how to write a spin lock. Uh, university students were re reading this like computer pornography. This was the hot thing. This was amazing. You could actually see how to write a scheduler, and it was all there. And by the way, it's still online for, for free. Um, put a copy on your phone and read it when you're stuck in an airport, and you will see how far we've come. But it's still great coding. And back then, you were a hot programmer if you had a monochrome monitor some sort of text editor to actually address the full screen, not a line editor, but a full screen editor, a step debugger and a compiler. No CI, CD, no containers, no nothing. If you had this, you were hot stuff. <laughs> and then some folks uh, started realizing that, hey, that, that Unix stuff makes sense. And they started a project called GNU. GNU's not Unix. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of pro projects around that time that had self-naming references. And the idea with GNU was to get around the at t license restrictions. And then about the same time, uh, computer networks like AlohaNet and Xerox started to really come to the forefront to share data, to interoperate between computers. And in the 1980s, Unix workstations were very, very popular. Rather than your company having one machine and being dedicated to whatever was going on, you could give your high-end engineers their own machine. So when they crashed, they didn't take down everybody else. It was also handy because it was uh, allowed them to work independently of each other and not step on each other's toes. And they were the hot setup for doing stuff like CAD CAM design. Okay, so we've gotten to the point now where we're getting away from being locked in to proprietary hardware. We now have some opportunities and we have an operating system. So the f beginnings of open source is out there with the GNU project. And about the same time, um, devices like this start showing up. Academics love this, small businesses loved it, but it was not really considered a real computer. Uh, matter of fact, when IBM uh, introduced their computer, they said they were going to legitimize the PC market, and Apple actually had an ad that they ran very briefly that said, the bastards welcome you to the, to the marketplace. So you might be in a place where, um, like my Former mother-in-law was an accountant, and for this, she could start running books on her, her machine. Or if you went the other way, you can get something like a Tandy TRS-80. These were handy, but they're still kind of hobbyist-level machines. A lot of people in business didn't take them seriously. What would make you take them seriously? Well, uh, before I go on to that, for those of you under 35, this is actually a telephone. <laughs> it stores no photos, no music, it won't give you GPS directions, and you actually plugged it into a thing called a modulator demodulator or modem, and at 300 baud, you can call into someone else's computer and work on something called a bulletin, bulletin board system and share messages and maybe relay email. This was early 1980s, this was the hot setup. <laughs> About this time, IBM realized that the Apple PC was doing okay, other PCs were doing okay, and a man named William Lowe decided that they wanted to have their own PC. So what do you do? You buy Atari, right? <laughs> Except Atari doesn't want to be bought. 
So he decides that we're going to make a machine called the IBM PC, and we're going to use off-the-shelf hardware. And this is where I call it the IBM mistake. Uh, there was also a period in the 1980s right after this where if you were in a Fortune 1000 company and your business wanted to do business uh, better, they would hire IBM senior VPs and VPs to come run your business. And then you found out that they really didn't know what they were doing at IBM, let alone at your business. So suddenly we have a machine that's off the shelf hardware. Great idea, right? Well, IBM likes monopolies and suddenly they realize that, gee, Dell, Hewlett Packard, all these other things can buy the same parts as we buy, put their label on there, and they're in the same business as IBM, and sometimes they're doing better. Now, the hot thing here, once again, was spreadsheets. You had accountants that suddenly could run books on their own machine. They could do what-if games. You know, what if we increase revenue 20% or taxes go up 2%? Do all these what-ifs. Wonderful, great idea. The other thing that happened about this time is businesses were buying these like mad for everybody to put on their desk because they, you didn't want them on the big mainframe. You wanted them to... Uh, do it all on their own desk. So what happened, uh, ironically, was that if you had an IBM PC at home and you had one at work, uh, you'd make a copy of a, of a disk and uh, you'd sneaker net it to someone else's machine or take it home. And suddenly you can run VisiCalc and WordPerfect in the office and at home. You had a computer of your own, you had all this stuff, and true, it was run mostly on pirated software, but it was a great idea because suddenly computers were ubiquitous and cheap. And unfortunately, <laughs> it came with something called Windows. Um, less said about that, the better. And about this time, <laughs> I, I love this picture. I honestly think at this show, this man's rear end should be chapped from all of us kissing it because he's done a major thing for us. Um, by the way, I found this picture by accident. I typed in St. Linda Storvald and this came up. I don't know who did this, but hats off to them. I don't even know if Linus knows about that. So back then, <laughs> Unix is just kind of getting going and there was an academic named Tannenbaum who, to get around AT&T licensing, was writing his own version of a Unix-like operating system called Minix. And one day, this guy named Linus Benedict Torvalds, how many knew his, his middle name before today? Uh, a couple of us. He writes that, hey, I have something that's like Minix. It doesn't have any Minix source code. I'm running the GNU comp uh, C compiler and a bash shell on it, and it's really not anything big. Uh, it's free of any Minix code. It is multi-threaded. Uh, it is not portable, and probably never support anything other than AT hard disks. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> for John Mad Dog Hall. He was walking around yesterday. He's another person that we need to, to thank. He heard about Linux and decided, I'm gonna send him a DEC Alpha. DEC Alpha was a very hot PC. It was a 64-bit RISC machine. It smoked everything out there. Unfortunately, DEC wanted to sell it with DOS or MS-DOS 3.1, which was like putting a huge governor on the engine of your car. But between Linus and Mad Dog, suddenly we had a portable operating system. Um, now, free is normally defined as either free beer or free speech. And unfortunately, free still has costs. And uh, usually in the Linux world, we're talking liberty, not price. But there's still prices to be paid, even if something like the Linux operating system is free. Opportunity costs, uh, maintenance costs, administration costs. The one thing we never really cover is sanity costs. Uh, those of you who still support other operating systems know how crazy it is sometimes. And Linux is just so freeform and adaptive and moving on. Um, so thank God we have Linux. Now, if you've never seen the four GNU freedoms, I use this as the idea of a social contract. The idea is that you go out and you download your, your open source software and you can use the program in ways that the original inventors never had envisioned. Uh, you can look at it, you figure out how it works. Maybe you have a better idea, maybe you're just curious, um, but you can take a look at it. Um, you wanna give it to a friend. It's under a, hopefully a new license or GPL or some sort of license. So you can hand it off to somebody. In the old days, you didn't. You were restricted license-wise on how you could do that. 
And the freedom number three, the freedom to improve the program and release your improvements. The great thing about Linux is it's like a beehive. You have a lot of people contributing. So it's always uh, getting better. Now, the great thing here is Linux gives us synergy. It's free, uh, it's open, interoperable, and encourages instead of discourages. A lot of young programmers who've grown up with the open source environment don't really realize how great we have it now. And the idea that we run all this stuff on commodity hardware is a godsend. Um, cheap networks facilitate interoperability and developers can basically do whatever they want to do, expand and contribute back. Suddenly, we had options. Uh, you had source code, use however you want. Uh, interoperability is a main key point. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something. Uh, suddenly, instead of paying $100,000 to Oracle for a basic license of a database, you got MySQL and Postgres for free. Uh, cost of acquiring software went towards zero. Hardware costs go way down. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Unix workstations, it was a pain in the butt to buy one because the vendor, Sun Microsystems, Apollo, uh, Soulborn, they really felt like they were doing you a favor to allow you to buy their hardware. <laughs> I mean, it was it was like pulling teeth. You have a, uh, the, the uh, POSIX and TCP IP standards. I mean, things are to mark, define, and just work. And suddenly you had multiple options to do things how you wanted to do. Now by 2017, 78% of all companies were using free and open source software. I don't know about you folks who are from the old days, but the idea of RPMs and devs managing packages rather than having to play with make, make files, major, major uh, revelation. Now you can customize things as you need at your choice and the GNU and similar licenses protect your intellectual property to a certain extent. And if you had the idea of something better, you could fork it. And then comes the greed. Um, 2013, I'm working for Oracle MySQL, and a friend of mine who's running MaxDB for MariaDB said, I'm suddenly cut off. My software that I want to use, the next release, has something called a BSL license on there. I either pay to use it, and then after a couple of years, it becomes free. And how many people are running software that's a couple of years old on a regular basis on their, their computers? Anyway, this person was rather uh, upset, and I was able to, uh, to talk them off the ledge. But suddenly, this is something that happened. People suddenly were being told you're going to have to pay to use your what was previously free software. Now, I don't think that greed is bad. I'm kind of from the uh, Thomas Sowell uh, School of Economics, where people get motivated to do stuff um, by greed. So I don't think greed is bad. Uh, is it legal to exploit the open source licenses of others? Well, part of the thing in the license is we, the author really doesn't have a lot of say in how it gets used. And is that exploitation, exploitation morally defensible? A lot of cases, no. Now, this lovely XKCD cartoon explains that we have this beautiful infrastructure supported by a very narrow piece of software that's maintained by one person. Uh, this is something in the open source world we need to address uh, because we have a lot of these little pillars. And um, how do we make sure that person doesn't get swamped? So license change. Are you forked? Well, you have choices. The first one is go along with the change and pay. I think that's extortion. Uh, stick to the last version before the change. Well, you do that, you have a lot of technical debt you just inherited. Uh, as the software changes around that product, uh, you might find yourself painted into a corner where you can't upgrade anything. Uh, your staff is not gonna be happy. Uh, find your creative fork or find an alternative. Maybe instead of running uh, MariaDB, you end up running uh, Postgres. But the thing is, you're forced to make a decision when they change their license. Now, if the license changes, uh, you have options. Uh, for those who are going to be around tomorrow, we have a Valky day. Six months ago, there was no Valky. Redis changes their license. 
people fork the code. Uh, they're improving it, and literally in six months, we've gone from zero to 100 miles an hour with a very fast in-memory data store. Uh, Terraform. Uh, a lot of folks I know love Terraform, but that got its license changed, and there's now open to tofu. And an interesting project uh, that Peter's company here does, it's the Mongo database project or protocol on top of Postgres. Now, if you love the protocol, but love Postgres too, that's another option for you. It doesn't have 100% of the features of Mongo right now. Give Peter another couple of weeks. Uh, but it's another option for you. That's one of the great things of the open source community. We have options. Now, do the big exploiters contribute enough? Anyone from AWS in here? Okay, uh, might piss you off here. Uh, <laughs> um, now, um, we need to encourage projects to stick with their open source software licenses. You know, we need to go to the sponsors of shows like this and say, hey, thank you for being open source. Thank you for supporting the open source community. Thank you for supporting the Linux Foundation. Uh, we need to call out those who do not. Uh, the folks who change their license need to be told, hey, we do not like that. Sometimes there are some new VCs only. Now, open source is not a business model. Uh, open source is a development methodology, and a lot of people forget that. Uh, a lot of computer programmers are great at computer programming, but they have no business sense, and they can't write a business plan to save themselves. And the open source model is not a suicide pact. If you're running a small project, get some advice on how to keep your business going. Um, you do not need to run yourself into the ground trying to stay pristine in this world. Also, we need a way to support small projects. Uh, remember that XKCD uh, cartoon. I'd like to see some sort of, I know the project this way, an endowment set up for upkeep of some of these minor projects, uh, set up something with universities, maybe apprenticeship programs, where these universities take over certain projects, maintenance, teach kids how to run GitHub, and uh, work on real programs to keep it going, put it part of the, the ongoing efforts for education. Now, the big cloud vendors um, will come back and tell you that they're spending a lot of time and money on open source. Well, that's true. Um, in 2023, Alphabet said they're spending 10%, uh, roughly 10% of Alphabet's full-time workforce actively contributed to open source projects. Um, that's, that's admirable. Uh, over the past five years, Google's released more than 7,000 open source elements. Uh, their definition of elements is kind of a little weak to me, but you know they, they are doing something. And AWS announced 10 million funding over three years to the OSSF and pledged 3 million in cloud credits to a cloud native foundation. Well, for you and I in this room, $13 million is a lot of money. But uh, in context, <laughs> by the way, this isn't the first Jeff Bezos yacht I showed you earlier in the production. This is his new one. Um, that 13 million they're, they're dropping off in the open source bucket uh, would probably pay for six, well, three months of keeping his yacht going. But it's okay because Jeff earns 25 million every three hours. So I don't know where it. Also, for those of you unaware, uh, he just bought a new Gulfstream G700, uh, $80 million. So that $13 million, great. Does he need to do more? Yes. Uh, brag warning, I work for a company called Percona, and we are very much into open source. We have our own ports of MySQL, Postgres, and Mongo, keeping the original licenses alive and the spirit alive, but we add features that have come in the community editions for free. Uh, our monitoring software is free. Our new DBAS software we just announced yesterday is free. Our business model is we make money off support and consulting. So there are some companies out there, and I do like to brag about Percona doing things the right way. Um, I don't know how many of you read the register. It's, a, uh, it's an interesting thing. Um, now, many years ago, you used to be able to read Stack Overflow or Slashdot and get good news of what's going on. Unfortunately, those have come um, 180 degrees from being reliable. 
the register has some very interesting commentary on stories. Uh, this one I'd like to point out to you. Uh, it's the first line up there is GPL fundamentally understands that not sharing is stealing. So when you have uh, companies that go out and take an open source product and customize it just for their own environment and don't give that source code back, I feel that's theft. Um, this commentary on an article on CockroachDB and their changes, um, the line, personally, rather than blaming the GPL permissive licenses, CockroachDBs or HashiCorps, I tend to blame all the big cloud vendors that are too stingy to give anything back to the original developers. Somehow we need to come up with a way that if you are uh, making a big lifestyle out of taking someone else's work and not following the, the rules and the norms of the open software thing, we need to call you out. We need to tell you you need to pay more, you need to do more. Uh, by the way, a lot of times you'll run into someone and say, okay, open source software, what is it good for? And what's really interesting to me is last week the story came out uh, from the Harvard Business School on the value of open source software. Now, if we had to reinvent the wheel every time, every year, it would cost between 2.6 and 13.2 trillion dollars. That is a huge amount. So when your colleagues and your friends and relatives say, the stuff that you give away for free, does it really have any real use, any real value? You can talk about the use and you can talk about this figure. And with that, uh, let's go to questions and hopefully answers. Um, if you do have a question, I'm supposed to record here so that future generations can figure out what we were doing here today. Uh, uh, once again, I'd like to introduce Peter Farkas from FerretDB. Uh, you've been, Ferret's been around for what, two years now? Yeah. Two years. And they're an example. Well, not me, myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just Ferret TV. Um, so this is an example of a company that saw a need and took advantage of it. So anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? I know this is a rough time. Last day of a show right before lunch and you... <laughs> Okay. Anything from anybody or? Oops, let's run this out. Wh whose responsibility is, do you think, to be the driving force to start pushing like the big vendors to start abiding by more kind of the open source mentality, I guess? Like who would be the, the shepherd, I guess? All of us. <laughs> yeah, all, all of us would be the shepherd. Also, I hate to say it, but the Linux Foundation is probably the best positioned to do that. Um, I don't know if they want to do that, um, but we need something like that to do advocacy of asking these bigger vendors for more money and figuring out how do we support these low-end developers. Feel free to disagree if you think, oh, we should just have IBM do this thing. Just very quickly, what, what pressure points or what choke points do we have or does the Linux Foundation have to put pressure on these companies? Can, can you think of any? Um, pressure points we could put on them. Well, the big one is peer pressure. Hey guys, you have Aurora out there which has modified versions of all these databases and yet you're not handing anything back. Could you step up and add more? And maybe we all vote with our feet and say, hey, we're not going to use this new feature because, <laughs> you know, we don't like the way you're dealing with stuff. I just had a, thank you so much. This was so uh, insightful and entertaining. Uh, I had a question about, um, I didn't understand the, the, uh, the first part when the operating system was not portable, but the license was given to, to certain partners like the UC Berkeley and so on. Uh, I didn't understand what was the license for, just to like use the, the software? Yeah, uh, originally an operating system from an IBM or control data or something like that ran only on their hardware and the restriction on the license was you are licensed to use it on this serial number CPU 
uh, that's it. Yes, tightly coupled. And then, I, then AT and T had this operating system that was written in C that you could actually share. Ran on PDP four or PDP sixes, PDP tens, uh, a couple of other machines out there, and they decided to make the license for the software to the the group, it, it was UC Berkeley, Sun Microsystems, or something like that. So the idea is that suddenly it's not coupled directly to the hardware; it's kind of a more general license. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah. Follow up. And the, the manual that you shared, um, uh, the, the commentary on the on on that software, was that uh, pirated? Was it like photocopied or was it allowed uh, like as a publication? Uh, Lion's commentary on Unix, as far as I know, his university, which was somewhere in England, had a license. Australia. Australia. I'm sorry to insult him. Uh, <laughs> The idea was that he was actually commenting on the code. He wasn't selling the code. He was just making comments on the code. Kind of got bypassed some of the legalese, but I don't know the full details, but that's how they did it. Yes, sir. Uh, when talking about the peer pressure, what is your personal opinion about when does the paradigm in the society changes to widely accept and support the open source paradigm? Um, in a lot of companies, open source is widely respected um, as the way to do things. Um, one of the problems we have with the big cloud vendors is 10 years ago, you wanted to buy a new disk drive. You want to finance, filled out the paperwork, got three quotes from three different vendors, put them back in, waited six months for the next capital budget to come through, and then on the loading dock would show up a box of your new disk drive. Today, you want more disk space? Click a button. Um, it's become too easy to just <laughs> go from zero to 100 uh, like that. Uh, I don't know if we can press back on the cloud vendor saying, you know, go back and do more good open source community type stuff. Yes, sir. From what I've seen, I don't think companies do open source because they believe in it or anything like that, or because they like contributing, but rather because it's cheaper for them to just get the feature and not have to pay for maintenance, security, and all of that. So they don't really do open source. They just add features and don't care about what happens with them after that, I would say. <laughs> it's like who buys a car for the seat belts? Everyone has a seatbelt in their car. It just kind of comes along for the ride. So there's a lot of that out there. Uh, also, you hire a programmer. And if they've grown up in the past 20 years, they're used to using open source software. So it's, you know, it's like um, the metric system. You know, everyone's been using it for a long time. You know, there are other systems out there, but why not just use the one that's most prevalent? Anyone over here have questions? <laughs> Whoops. Perhaps just an observation, there's a limit to how much we can rely on some organization like the Linux Foundation because there's a fundamental conflict of interest because they are funded by those companies that we would like to see change. Uh, ironically, a couple of weeks ago in the US, a commentator was mentioning at a big political convention that all these politicians are saying, yeah, we're gonna go after these big corporations that they all bought the sky booths around the arena where they're having the show. So, okay, someone back here. Okay. Thanks. Um, we seem to be crawling through ancient history, and uh, you mentioned AT&T starting Unix and probably owning the copyright. And I remember in 2003, 4, 5, there was a series of court cases with, uh, I think it was Sco and Novell, IBM, etc. Do you know what happened? Those copyrights were they buried at the bottom of the sea, or who do you think now actually owns the copyright to Unix? Yeah. Um, if you find the old timers or Linus himself and talk about the bad days of Sco and all that, uh, there are people who literally went out there and either got a copyright or some sort of trademark on Linux or various names on Linux and decided to defend them. And fortunately, most of those cases were uh, either thrown out of court or the person trying to defend it ran out of money. 
Now, I don't know the official legal status, but it's one of those things where they were able to show prior art to this person's claim. You know, oh, you claim you invented the car, but there's 5,000 on the parking lot, and you claim you started it on Tuesday, and I know at least one of the cars out there was made on Monday. So that's the type of crazy stuff that happened. Oh, way back there. Thanks for the talk. A comment on your previous comment. If we look at the open source ecosystem, all the um, projects that you have on GitHub, you can see that you have two types of companies. You have the companies that have an opportunistic approach. They will take whatever they need. They will push maybe one or two patches and then they leave. And then you have companies which have a long-term co commitment. They say, those are our critical infrastructure projects. They are open source. We work with other companies to get them to a better state, a safer state. And we can see that in the Linux kernel. So we have basically two types of approach. Thank you. Uh, one thing I mentioned to young programmers coming out of uh, high schools or colleges, go out and look at your, the company you're looking at's GitHub site. What are they giving away? How well is it documented? Um, how does it represent the company? Because that's a good reflection of what the internal structures of the company are. If they're doing that right, hopefully they're doing other stuff right. Let's see, I'm out of time yet. Uh, one last question, if anyone... How would you approach an argument with a company to maybe make an advancement or a convincing argument to like, okay, uh, make a patch to open source uh, uh, when the basic argument usually is, okay, um, we don't want to support someone else because we have a business model that is doing their thing proprietarily. So why should we do it? We don't want to support random people. Well, one argument is that if we get them doing it our way, they'll forget about the other ways and therefore they'll know it's our way and that will go there. The other thing you talk about the bigger collective, the bigger community as a whole saying, hey, we want to be part of this. We want to know, be known as being a contributor. And that argument usually works fairly well. So, well, if you have any more comments, questions or that, and you're just kind of shy, please come down to the Pocono booth. And I want to thank you all for coming out today and I hope you have a great show.